I'd like to invite everyone to take a seat. Welcome, everyone. I'm Kathleen McCartney, president of Smith College. Welcome, friends. Welcome, colleagues. Welcome, distinguished alumni. This year marks the 30th year since the founding of Otelia Cromwell Day. Today, we continue our work to become a more just community, a more equitable community, a more inclusive community. I approach this work as a learner, and I look forward to today's plenary as well as to the workshops this afternoon. As most of you know, this event honors two of Smith's most celebrated educators, Otelia Cromwell, class of 1900, and Adelaide Cromwell, class of 1940. Adelaide passed away this year, and her loss was felt throughout our community. Later in the program, you will hear a tribute to Adelaide, along with some important announcements about how Smith College will honor her legacy. I am pleased, however, to welcome Adelaide's son, Tony Hill, today. Tony, please take a bow. Thank you for being with us. The theme of this year's Otelia Cromwell Day is acknowledging injustice and practicing anti-racism. This work begins with acknowledging the injustices of the past and present and working to redress them. As such, let us never forget that Otelia Cromwell did not experience full inclusion at Smith College, nor did her niece Adelaide. We recognize their courage in the face of racism at Smith and in the world. We also recognize the courage of our own community today. I attended yesterday afternoon's powerful session organized by black students exposing the truth, Smith College and the N-word. One message resonated strongly with me in my role as president. Black students here want the administration to help them heal. I'll be working with Floyd Chung and others in the administration to do that. And now please join me in welcoming Floyd Chung, Vice President for Equity Inclusion and the Chair of the Otelia Cromwell Day Committee. Thank you for that warm introduction, Kathy. Dear students, staff, faculty, and guests, I am honored to greet you. I am also mindful of those who could not be with us today, especially Adelaide Cromwell, class of 1940, who had graced us with her presence many times in the past few years. Before we begin in earnest, would you please take a deep breath with me? I will now offer the college's land acknowledgement which is part of Smith policy, thanks in part to a collaboration with the Indigenous Smith Students Alliance and colleagues in Native American Studies. Smith College acknowledges and appreciates the fact that the space in which we gather today is built within the ancestral homelands of the Nanatok peoples. We also recognize our present day neighboring indigenous nations, the Nipmuc and the Wampanoag to the east, the Mohegan, Pequot, and Narangaset to the south, the Mohican and the Mohawk to the west, and the Abenaki to the north. Finally, we acknowledge and celebrate the presence of indigenous people here among us today. The theme for Otelia Cromwell Day this year is acknowledging injustice and practicing anti-racism. We have a land acknowledgement, which is an important step toward acknowledging injustice. But concrete actions need to be taken to truly practice anti-racism. I look forward to working with all of you on this. In a similar vein, many of us yesterday heard students testify the truth about the N-word. Their stories have awakened me to their pain. Acknowledging harm is the first step towards practicing anti-racism. Your provost, Michael Thurston, and I will follow up by taking action at our next faculty meeting. While we have responded to student concerns about the use of the N-word in the past, 
with panels and teaching improvement efforts. We are going to do something different this time. Why? As I've been saying at other speeches, I believe that inclusion is not a binary state of yes, we have it, or no, we don't. I believe that we need to apply a growth mindset to the work of fostering inclusion. This means that we'll often be out of our comfort zones, make mistakes, and learn how to get better at inclusion together. In that spirit, I admit that I have learned in these past few weeks about how the N-word is so violent that hearing it at all, even in a well-prepared classroom setting, viscerally harms students and prevents them from learning. Hence, the provost and I are taking preventative action. At our next faculty meeting, we will tell everyone that while we affirm the principle of academic freedom, all colleagues should be aware of the fact that pronouncing the N-word in class may significantly harm their students. We will then talk with chairs and directors about how to sustain this message over time to reach new colleagues and remind current ones. Acknowledging injustice and practicing anti-racism. This is hard work, complicated work, but necessary work. As a side but very important note, I urge you to take care of yourselves and one another as we do this difficult work. Offering and receiving gratitude and kindness can go a long way. Otelier Cromwell Day has been part of the way that Smith College has done the work of improving equity and inclusion since 1989. The day started at the urging of students, students like Janetta Condelario, class of 90, who will speak later in today's program. Students like those who spoke to me about the N-word and the importance of land acknowledgement. And students like those who are about to lead us in song. Please help me welcome Black Capella to the stage. be singing lift every voice and sing please stand as you are able and so choose to your lyrics are located in the programs Tears that 
has been watered. We have come treading our path through the blood of the slaughtered. Out from the gloom. Thanks to Black Capella, which is led by Ava Dujon, class of 21. Yeah. Now it's my pleasure to introduce my dear colleague, Andrea Hairston, class of 74. All right. <laughs> she, is, she is Louise Wolf Kahn, professor of theater and professor of Africana studies. Professor Hairston is a star teacher, an award-winning science fiction writer, and a champion of equity and inclusion. She will tell us more about Otelia Cromwell. <sighs> Hello. Okay, so I'm gonna move this so I can see what I'm reading. In the summer of 1899, in a letter to her father, Otelia Cromwell wrote, did you know that there were short articles about my entering Smith in the New York Herald and Philadelphia Times? It's a quick offhand comment, but it spoke to a monumental moment for Smith College, for higher education, and for the country. Born under Jim Crow, Dr. Cromwell lived through the civil rights era passing away in 1972 at the age of 98. Despite the enormous challenges facing black women and women of color in any profession, she moved inexorably through her education to become an accomplished and well-respected scholar and educator, as well as an advocate for civil rights and racial and gender equality. Dr. Cromwell's niece, Adelaide Cromwell, also a Smith alum, described her aunt's understated gravitas. Well, she wasn't confrontational, but she wasn't fearful, and she was gentle in appearance, dignified. What she said then is true now, that you must stand up for what you believe in. You must be independent. You must be caring. You must be appreciative and fearless. Dr. Cromwell was born in 1874 in a prominent Washington, D.C. family. Her father, John Cromwell, was a distinguished journalist, scholar, lawyer, and educator. 
After completing high school, Dr. Cromwell earned a teaching certificate from the Minor Normal School and taught in the DC public schools for six years while taking courses at Howard University. In 1897, she applied to transfer to Vassar and Smith. But only Smith was prescient enough to accept her. So while a student at Smith, Dr. Cromwell was not allowed to live in a campus residence hall, boarding off campus instead. However, in an 1899 letter to her father, she spoke of her experience at Smith and the education she was receiving. At Smith, the members of the faculty show so much human interest in the students. Classroom work and a high standard at that is required of us, but our health and comfort is so carefully looked after. When she graduated from Smith, Dr. Cromwell returned to Washington, teaching high school English, German, and Latin. She continued her education, completing her MA in English at Columbia University in 1910, and her doctorate in English at Yale in 1926, the first African-American woman to do so. Dr. Cromwell was a quiet but powerful force. She served as one of the only women on the board of directors of the Encyclopedia of the Negro, working with her colleague W.E.B. Du Bois. She was the author of numerous essays which touted the importance of education as a method of resistance. She was an independent thinker and a committed social justice activist in her own way. Ooh. Dr. Cromwell went on to become an English professor at Minor, and at her retirement in 1944, the DC Board of Education published a statement notably similar to Dr. Cromwell's early assessment of the faculty at Smith College. The influence she ex exerted in her position cannot be easily estimated encouraging students to pursue graduate work in leading universities, stimulating them to write, she was still never too busy to listen to their problems or to entertain them in small groups in her home. So after retiring, Dr. Cromwell began her most ambitious scholarly work, a biography of another pioneering woman, suffragist and abolitionist Lucretia Mott, which was published by Harvard University Press in 1958. In 1950, Dr. Cromwell returned to Smith to receive an honorary Doctor of Laws degree. Otelia Cromwell Day um, not only celebrates Dr. Cromwell as our first African-American graduate, it celebrates her as the quintessence of a Smith graduate unapologetically and unceasingly asserting her place in her education, her career, and in the world. Lisa Daniels, a 2016 graduate, captured the import of Dr. Cromwell's achievements well. Okay, this is not about one culture. This is not about one race. This is, this is not about just one person in particular, but you exist here because she was here. We are all part of her legacy in one form or fashion, through race, through class, through culture, through being women in the world, trying to understand how we can be leaders in our own lives and in our communities. Thank you. Thank you, Andrea. Um, now, it's my honor to introduce Camille Oliver, class of 20. Right. 
She is a member of the Black Students Alliance and Smith African and Caribbean Students Association. Three years ago, she was my pre-major advisee. Now we've come full circle. She has been working with me on today's program and rehearsing the poem that she is about to read for you. Maven by Nikki Finney for Otelia Cromwell, 1874 to 1972. Genus, daughter. When you are a thinking woman, neither violence or sugar plums can muzzle the power of thought. Imagine hatch, comprehend, apprehend, know the inside and the out. You are just a girl when your mother dies, left to tend the rest of the flock. You, the oldest, the one most like your father, taught to leave no stone unturned, Mary thrift and industry while burying your head in the stacks. Sang foi, but never silent. Inquire, picture, ponder, think over, think and think again. Giddy with your own mind, master everything is the family crest. No veil feigning, Baking, guise, masquerade, or fanfare. There is a right way and a wrong. When you give your hand to the world, your responsibility to have a mind, keep in mind, change a mind, and be the last to die. Genus, scholar. An educated group is a thinking group. Intuit, divine, check and recheck, invent. Know the backward and the forward. You care nothing for the popular, even less for the slipshod. Your arms flower with all the leading out books, choosing wisely what and who trains you. Frankness, virtuoso, mastery, crackerjack, think and think again. You leave college and university exceptionally prepared. You are complex, and astute, as calm as a comma. No time for jewelry or parlor bows. There is a gold watch, a signet ring, a Smith College pin, white letters on gold just above the heart. Diligent, proficient, self-possessed, you weigh in with words to state your tolerance to the inefficient. You never back down from what is right. Young Adelaide is your dependable. And the ninth graders leaning into your instruction whisper, this must be college. You gray beautifully, but early. Genus. Writer, the genius does not write to please. 
nor live to marry. Veritas. Words pulled through a fine tooth comb, then, before sleep, pulled through again. You refuse to segregate language from life, read German for sport, and swing golf clubs just to stay on the qui vive. You write of the legality of taxes, pika out democracy, vow and edit for the integral Negro intellectual. Winnow, probe, sift through, quest, think and think again. Solemnly engaged now to Lucretia and Thomas, you dislike being called doctor and remain forever keen on miss. What the dutiful trained hand can perfectly stitch delights you, unconventional and easygoing. Your desire never wanes. To be put through the paces, edify, enlighten, to work outward from simple seam to monogram. We herald your bright hallmark of firsts, those sprightly high-waisted truths, the soft-spoken whippersnapper eloping still. Thank you. Thank you, Camille. Ah, oh, thank you. Um, now it's my pleasure to introduce Kim Alston, our Muslim student advisor and friend of the Cromwell family, and Janetta Condelario, class of 90, professor of sociology and of Latin American and Latino-Latina studies. Kim attended the service for Adelaide Cromwell earlier this week and will offer a personal tribute. Janetta, is both an activist and a scholar in Adelaide's field, sociology. She will put her legacy in an intellectual context. I met Dr. Adelaide McGuinn Cromwell in the mid-1980s as a student at Boston University. Professor Gulliver, as she was known then, was my sociology professor in Afro-American studies and one of only two black professors I had as an undergraduate student. Adelaide was always passionate and enthusiastic about the material she presented in class, naming for me for the first time, gifted, talented black women activists of historical distinction. Through her leadership and acumen, I became acquainted with such giants as Mary Church Terrell, Ida B. Wells, and Mary McLeod Bethune. The experience prompted me to declare sociology as a minor in my junior year. Having grown up in Boston, I was not readily exposed to black role models or this aspect of American history. From Adelaide's class, I discovered something that was missing in my life's perspective, the undeniable power of womanhood, of, un of educated women who believed in organizing and producing thought into action. This noted power of resilience and competence changed my life and raised my expectations about the importance of women, particularly black women, in mass movements and local communities. So when I think about Adelaide Cromwell, Smith class of 1940, first black faculty member at Smith College, 1945 to 1947, I see a change maker, a risk taker, 
an intellectual guide, a teacher of special prominence. Now, I don't recall that Adelaide executed any particular noteworthy teaching style, but know that her curriculum in the Afro-American Studies program that she founded at BU ignited a spark in me around black women leadership. Even at age 99, Adelaide cultivated intellectual curiosity in those around her, as expressed in the memorial in her honor at BU on Tuesday. Years after our initial meeting, I would serve as her campus contact for Atelia Cromwell Day for nearly a decade. We had a good relationship. It was a simple formula. She called me up, told me what to do, and I did it. <laughs> as much as I was responsible for the logistics of her travel to campus in itinerary schedule, I was also someone to whom she would speak frankly. She shared with me her disdain for the college's commissioned watercolor portrait of Otelia Cromwell by Richard Yard and the story behind Otelia's portrait she commissioned from Georgine Hill. She even mailed me a copy of the letter she sent to Yale chastising it for a portrait of her aunt by one of Yale's graduate students. Adelaide had high hopes for students. She wanted them to pursue knowledge that helped them kindle diverse perspectives. She thought students should break out of their silos and learn about the world in which they live by befriending those who were different from themselves. She was a firm believer in standing up for principles, for values, and for what one believed in, like her auntie. She believed in being uninhibited by current realities and explore the possibilities. If you read any of Adelaide's books, which, by the way, are on display at the exhibit in Nolan Art Lounge until November 10th, you would see this pattern of thought and history dating back to Willis Hodges Cromwell, her great-grandfather. Adelaide always talked about Atelia in glowing terms and with words of admiration and gratitude for her role as a mothering aunt. Once when she led a workshop at Atelier Cromwell Day at about age 95, she couldn't understand why students had not read her book and Atelier if they really expected to ask good questions. It is truly my honor and distinct pleasure to pay tribute to Adelaide for her unyielding wit and feistiness, her beautiful contagious smile, her tendency to speak truth to power, her dignified, alluring manner, her charismatic spirit, her fierce defense of the Cromwell family legacy, her support of Boston Latin students, where I went to high school. We will miss our dear honored guest at the annual Otelia Cromwell Day celebrations, but I also thank her for leaving her son, Tony Cromwell Hill, who is with us today and will carry on the Cromwell legacy. In the words of Dr. Vivian Johnson, a close friend and colleague of Adelaide's at BU, she was, quote, a brilliant example of black womanhood that influenced my life and displayed strength in struggle. So all of you Smithies who struggle for balance, who struggle for equity, inclusion, visibility, or personal triumph as you define it, or the recognition of your humanity, you are in good company in a fellow alum known as Adelaide Cromwell. Good afternoon, buenas tardes. As a sister alumni, class of 1990, who together with Wambui Mwangi, daughter of another famous first here at Smith College, who was directly involved with the student organizing that led to the creation of Otelia Cromwell Day, and who is currently a sociologist of blackness and feminisms in the Americas, it is truly, truly my great honor to offer these brief remarks in honor of Professor Adelaide Cromwell on what is the 30th anniversary of Otelia Cromwell Day and the 20th anniversary of my own tenure as a faculty member in the sociology department here at Smith. 
Though I had the pleasure of sharing a panel stage with Professor Adelaide Cromwell for the 25th anniversary celebration in 2014, I confess that I did not have the opportunity to get to know Professor Cromwell well. If I had had the chance before she passed, I would have shared with her that her work on Boston's black upper class directly connects to my own work documenting the history of feminism in what is called the cradle of blackness in the Americas, the Dominican Republic and its diaspora. For as I have discovered over the past 15 years of doing this research, that history, my history, is linked to the liberation struggles ranging from the Afro-diasporic Pan-Antillian independence movements of the Caribbean to the internationalism of the black bourgeoisie and laboring classes alike that she studied, to the black and white suffragist movements of the United States and Europe and the Americas. Moreover, the role of Washington, D.C. and Boston, both home places to the Cromwell family story, and in her research agendas, resonate in my own research on the history of feminism in the Dominican Republic. This strikes me not as serendipitous, but as affirmative and inspirational at precisely in the moment in my own work when I needed it the most. I realized all of this when thanks to the invitation of my dear colleague, Floyd Chung, I was asked to explore Professor Cromwell's professional and intellectual biography, which I would like to share with you briefly in the hopes that you too will be inspired to go and read her work yourselves. But let me go back to the origin story here at Smith. While here in the 1930s, just before World War I began, in the midst, in the middle of what is known as the Nadir in African American history, Professor Adelaide was, quote, president of the Social Science Club, in which membership, she writes, was limited to 20 sociology majors and two majors in economics. Also, she noted, the Journal of Heredity published one of her term papers written in her senior year, and her honors thesis was one of the two chosen to receive the Samuel Bowles Prize, which, by the way, the sociology department still awards for the most distinguished paper in sociology. Not surprisingly, she graduated with honors in 1940 and returned in 1945 as the first African-American member of the faculty and the last African-American member of the sociology department, 1945. When asked by an interviewer for the Northeastern University's Lower Roxbury Black History Project in 2009, what it was like to be a black female sociologist in the middle of the 20th century when she entered the profession, Professor Cromwell said, quote, I was always interested, no matter what the teacher was talking about, I was interested in how it related to me, and I wanted to educate them some, my professors. So I did. Thus, while she was at Harvard taking a class on revolution, she decided that her work would focus on the Haitian Revolution no matter what the professor said. As she writes, quote, I can't remember any professor that had the nerve to try and go against me. <laughs> if you know what you're talking about, you know, end quote. Professor Cromwell helped to establish what we now call intersectionality studies. She was working very much in the tradition establishing the tradition forged by her predecessors and her colleagues in the field of US sociology, W.B. Du Bois, Anna Julia Cooper, and I dare say, her auntie, who though not a sociologist, certainly modeled for her niece the sociological imagination. As is often still the case today, Professor Cromwell took on the work of establishing the Afro-American Studies Program, an extensive and intensive institution-building labor of love that prevented her, 
until she retired in 1985 from publishing the full-length book manuscripts that she had been working on throughout the decades before. So allow me briefly to list these for you. One of her first truly important and I think underappreciated works was a book called Developing a Black Meritocracy, a history of black graduates of Boston Latin School. She notes that the small pamphlet was part of a quote, Heritage Guild group project. The Heritage Guild was a group of black women from the greater Boston area dedicated to preserving the evidence of black presence in Boston. Professor Cromwell was one of those 15 women. It is a who's who of the black bourgeoisie of the 19th and early 20th century in Boston. Her next major work, which came to be serendipitously because it featured a namesake that she did not know she had in West Africa when she was there studying, teaching at the invitation of her graduate school friend Nkwame Nkrumah in Ghana, friends who took her to Sierra Leone, was a book called An African Victorian Feminist, The Life and Times of Adelaide Smith Casely Hayford. 1848 to 1960, published by Howard University Press. As she notes in the introduction to this book, she came to that work while teaching in Ghana and visiting Freetown at the invitation of her friends. And she came to find out, much to her surprise, that actually, Casely Hayford's husband had corresponded with Adelaide Cromwell's beloved grandfather. She also mentions in an interview I had the good fortune to find that while she was at UPenn studying with her friend Nkrumah, she also worked at the Urban League in Inglewood, New Jersey. While working at the Eng Urban League in Inglewood, she came across a Sister Smith alum. She asked this alum, who was counseling students about uh, college admissions, where she was suggesting her students apply. Have you asked them to apply to Smith or Wellesley? She writes that this sister alum wrote, oh, they couldn't afford to go to Smith or Wellesley. And Professor Adelaide responded, that's not your business to decide whether they can afford it. It's your business to get them there. She subsequently said in that interview, by the way, that two years later, that same alum wrote to her to report that in fact, she had mentored two students into Smith, to which Professor Cromwell responded, it's about time, what took you so long? <laughs> Her next major work was The Other Brahmins, Boston's Black Upper Class, 1750 to 1950. A review in the New England Quarterly noted that, quote, this pioneering study is a no-nonsense analysis of Boston's racial and social caste system at Miss Century that poses an important theoretical question about the dynamic between class and caste within the black community, as well as a focus on social class as a mechanism to examine minority and majority group relations. Using words like a pioneering work that alerted scholars to the importance of studying the black upper class as a harbinger of changing national values, this reviewer said, and I agree, Adelaide Cromwell's work can serve as a model for young scholars engaged in the controversies about American history and racial identity that pockmark our own time. Unveiled Voices, Unvarnished Memories, the Cromwell Family in Slavery and Segregation, 1692 to 1972, was published by the University of Missouri in 2006. And like her other work, brings the sociological imagination to bear on intersectional historical sociology through the example of her own family to illuminate the nature of discrimination, violence, and overcoming these collectively as well as individually. And finally, I want to close with a quote that resonated deeply with me, and I imagine will resonate with many in this audience, from her book, My Mothering Aunt, Otelia Cromwell. That I survived, indeed, that I prospered during my Smith College years and have enjoyed a successful career 
and that similarly, Smith College was never publicly accused of racial discrimination, can, to some extent, be attributed to the caring role played by Otelia Cromwell. May they both rest in peace. Thank you, Kim and Janetta. Ah, now I get to introduce Denise Wingate Mater, class of 74, your Vice President for Alumni Relations. Besides having a passion for working with diverse alumni, she has a PhD in education. Her dissertation examined the conditions contributing to black women becoming firsts and thriving in positions of leadership and authority. As such, she is the perfect introducer for our keynote speaker, Deborah Archer, class of 93, an alumna and national leader and authority on civil rights and racial justice. Denise. I come to you today standing on the shoulders of two celebrated alums. First and foremost, Otilia Cromwell, for whom this day has been named, the first known black graduate from Smith College in the class of 1900. And today we add to her cherished memory her niece, Adelaide Cromwell, the first known African-American faculty member also a graduate of Smith College, class of 1940. We know that when any of us does something great, we never do it alone. And so it becomes not only tradition, but necessary to remember, to honor, to celebrate, and to recognize the contribution of the, their gifts and their impact on our lives. And so I stand here today as the first black woman to now lead and be the face of Smith alumni because Otilia and Adelaide came before me. They represent the strength the vision, the fortitude, the resilience, the commitment and action that it takes to be a first. Today, we gather with momentum initiated by the Cromwell legacy and to share in the inheritance that belongs to every alum who graduates from this college, while at the same time, speak truth to power, to confront the inequities and stand up to our beloved institution of power and privilege and require it to pay attention and change. I am here with a distinct honor to introduce you to another great black woman who similarly stands up to institutions and situations to confront and combat racism and isms of any kind. Her name is Deborah Archer. Let me read to you some of her notable accomplishments because this is what her bio says. Deborah Archer, is an associate professor of clinical law, co-faculty director of the Center on Race, Inequality, and the Law, and director of the Civil Rights Clinic at NYU School of Law. She is a nationally recognized expert in civil rights and racial justice and teaches and writes in the areas of racial justice, civil rights, and clinical pedagogy. In the Civil Rights Clinic, Deborah and her students represent indigent, institutional, and pro bono clients in a range of civil rights matters, including employment discrimination, educational equity, voting rights, and criminal justice reform. Deborah is a graduate of Smith College and Yale Law School. 
She previously worked as an attorney with the American Civil Liberties Union, the ACLU, and the NAACP Legal Defense and Educational Fund, where she litigated in the areas of voting rights, employment discrimination, and school desegregation. Deborah is currently a member of the Board of Directors and General Counsel to the Board of the American Civil Liberties Union. She is also the chair of the American Association of Law School Section on Civil Rights and a former chair of the Section on Minority Groups. She previously served on the New York City Civilian Complaint Review Board, the nation's oldest and largest police oversight agency, and the 2018 New York City Charter Revision Commission. Deborah received the Otto L. Walter Distinguished Writing Award and the 2014 Haywood Burns Shannara Gilbert Award from the Northeast People of Color Legal Scholarship Conference. And if that wasn't enough, Deborah was recently recognized by the New York Law Journal as one of New York's top women in law. So reading her robust and compelling bio, I became curious about Deborah as a person. And I wondered about some of the experiences in her formative years that might have contributed to such passion and drive and zeal. Turns out, I didn't have to look further than the Smith Alumni Quarterly Spring 2019 edition where Deborah's account of her time here at Smith was featured in the series of articles depicting to be a black woman. Born to immigrant parents of Jamaican descent, Deborah grew up in Hartford, Connecticut, and came to Smith College as a first generation student and a member of the class of 1993. Deborah describes her time here at Smith as shaping who she is today in many wonderful ways, and in some ways that were not so positive. In Deborah's first year, and as a resident in Tyler, she received a racist note under her door, calling her the N-word, and saying she should go home. Thankfully, she didn't. Instead, she went on to graduate cum laude and to become a warrior for civil rights, equity, and racial justice. Deborah's advice to anyone facing a similar incident is this. You have to figure out how you're going to empower yourself in difficult situations and make sure that people don't get what they want. If I had crumbled or disengaged, or if I had gone, then I would have allowed them to succeed. My mantra in life is, I'm never going to allow someone else, their views, their biases, to deny me an opportunity I find the support that I need, I find the networks that I need, so that I'm going to get the same benefits that those who are biased against me are getting out of this experience. What's important to notice, and why do I share this? Because this incident happened 30 years ago. And here we are having the same discussion about the use of the N-word and its impact just yesterday. Based on Deborah's situation and those we still currently face, I would offer that even when something bad happens, something good can emerge. Deborah says it this way, in this current challenging time, it's important for all of us, each of us, to pick a lane that we can fight in. So together, we move the needle. As the leader of alumni, and as a black woman, I am so proud of this daughter of Smith and Yale. And let us not forget that Otilia was the first African-American woman to receive a doctorate from Yale. I am so proud of her for picking her lane and doing her work. Whether in the classrooms or in the courts, she is still doing her work. And she has come here today to remind us there is still much work to be done. I introduce to you now activist, scholar, teacher, 
lawyer, role model, warrior for social justice, mother, partner, and powerful alum, Deborah Archer. Thank you. Thank you, Denise, for that incredible introduction. I kind of wish you did that after I spoke, because now I have to live up to that, and that's um, going to be quite a challenge. And thank you to President McCartney and the members of the organiz organizing committee for inviting me to be here on this day. It is really an honor and nice to be back at Smith College. It's especially exciting and to be back here to participate in honoring Otelia Cromwell and her legacy. I share and am inspired by her deep commitment to civil rights and racial justice and exercising our responsibility towards others. I also, I think, share with her the commitment to using my Smith education and my privilege as a professor to advance civil rights and racial justice whenever I have the opportunity, and I certainly view my job as a, a professor as a continuation of my career as a civil rights lawyer. And Smith definitely helped instill those values in me. As uh, Denise mentioned, sometimes I learn those things in the best ways, the ways that you hope everyone learns lessons when they go off to college, through my coursework, through volunteer service that was encouraged when I was here at Smith, through my classmates, and through my wonderful professors. But sometimes those lessons were much, much harder and Smith did not always feel like a welcoming place for me. Uh, this beautiful campus, this extraordinary community, often I didn't feel like I belonged here. I would say like every day I questioned whether or not I belong here. And it broke my heart to learn that there are still people here who are actively working to make sure that other students don't feel like they belong here. And it has been 30 years. And we've made so much progress, but in so many ways, it seems like we haven't actually moved the needle. I'm not who many people think of when they envision a graduate of Smith College. As Denise mentioned, I'm the, a first generation American. My parents are from Jamaica. And I'm the first person in my family to graduate from college. My father is 71 years old and today still works as a machinist in a factory. And my mother spent most of her career processing bills um, in a bank. And when I got to Smith, there weren't many women who shared my background or my skin color, and there were plenty of times when I questioned whether this was the place for me. Also, as Dean's mentioned, during my first year, someone slipped a racist note under my door at Tyler House, a place that I had started to feel like was home. And that note, as far as I was concerned, was intended to let me know that I was right, that my feelings were right, that this place wasn't for me. And for a while, her note had its intended effect. I retreated into myself. I didn't trust anyone because I didn't know who sent that note. It could have been anyone who lived in that house with me, who I thought were family, who I thought were friends. And I considered, again, leaving school. There were many people at Smith who supported me and made sure that eventually I came back to feeling like I belonged and stopped me from going home. I found lifelong friends and an incredible mentor in Professor Alice Hurst. But every day was a challenge. And my experience as a black woman entering a place like Smith is not unique. America is built on a beautiful idea, the American dream. My immigrant parents would tell you that that American dream is why they came to this country, that uniquely American idea that your birth should not define your destiny. But the truth is that the American dream is just that, it's a dream. We as a country have an incredible history of espousing great ideals, but really sorry in our actions. And maybe the only thing more American, the American dream, is our failure to honor it. The American dream says that it doesn't matter where you're from, who your parents are, what your skin color is, or how much money you have. If you work hard and you're of good character, then there is no job, no community, no opportunity, no campus that's off limits to you. But we all know that that has never, ever been true. It has always mattered where you are from. It has always mattered the color of your skin, who your parents are, and how much money you have. And that is the American reality. 
And yet, look at my family. My parents never had the opportunity to go to college, and they struggled every day to provide a safe home and food for their children. But I went to Smith College and then on to Yale Law School. And look at how different Smith College is today, the incredible diversity in this room among students, faculty, staff, the programs that they have in place to make sure that there's not just diversity, but they were moving to equity and inclusion. And I often think about the fact that Ruth Simmons was the president of Smith College just a few years after someone slipped a racist note under my door telling me to go home. So in so many ways, big and small, the history of America has been the story of the American reality edging closer to the American dream, day after day, year after year, decade after decade, and generation after generation. I think that's what Langston Hughes meant in his poem, let America be America again. Oh, let America be America again, the land that never has been yet, and yet must be, the land where every man is free, the land that's mine, the poor man's, Indians, Negroes, me. I believe that he meant that although America has not kept its promise, one day America would truly be the land of opportunity promised to us all. This gap between the American dream and the American reality, it is not just an abstraction. It is tactile. We feel it every day. We feel it in the neighborhoods where we live, the schools our children attend. That's what I felt when I first came to Smith, that border between the American dream and the American reality, the feeling that you belong in one America and you're trespassing in the other. And in this country, the most reliable marker between those two, two Americas has always been race. Social dominance, theory, social dominance theorists contend that human societies inevitably organize into groups and that these groups are arranged as either dominant or subordinate. The dominant group exercises power and creates social norms that preserve their status and their access to superior resources. They also argue that privileged groups create legitimizing myths. These myths justify the unequal distribution of resources. The dominant group comes to believe in those myths and rely on them to support their superior status. So while, while white people have always been depicted as smart and free and civilized, black people and other people of color were portrayed as savages and violent and foreigners, and these are the myths that have been used to justify racial subjugation over centuries. And now white communities dominate capital and political power. They dominate the best schools, best jobs, highest quality housing. And another fascinating thing about this is the lengths to which those with power and privilege will fight to preserve that power and privilege. And the extent to which they will lie to themselves and others to preserve the myths that rec reconcile that gap between the American dream and the American reality. And I know that you all know that this is not history, this is today. And one way that white communities often unconsciously hold on to their status and their superior resources is to claim privileged spaces, spaces like Smith College, as their own, as white spaces. It is in the nature of white supremacy to claim ownership over those privileged spaces, to preserve them as white spaces, and to defend them against those who would seek to violate those spaces. We can look at housing. We know how housing segregation has given white communities access to greater wealth and opportunities. Residential segregation impacts an individual's access to quality education, to employment opportunities, to government services, to social capital, to health. And then look at the lengths to which some white communities have gone to hoard access to that opportun those opportunities. You can think of sundown towns where whole towns excluded black people through a combination of discriminatory local laws, intimidation, and violence. The term came from signs that were posted in those towns that let black people know that you can come here to work for us, you can come here to serve us, but you should never ever think that you can make this town your home. Or think of federal mortgage programs that would only lend money to prospective black homeowners if the property that they sought to buy was in a segregated neighborhood. And think of federal interstate highway system. And I know most people are thinking the federal interstate highway system, but yes, the federal interstate highway system. Highways were intentionally built through and around black communities to physically entrench 
racial inequality, and protect white spaces and privilege. In some states, highways tore right through uh, black communities, removing the heart and soul from those communities when they destroyed homes and churches and schools and businesses. In other states, the highway system was a tool of a segregationist agenda. Erecting a wall that separated black and white communities, protecting white communities from black migration. And the highway created physical, economic, and psychological barriers that we still see today. And think of the United States' long and complicated history of racial segregation in housing enforced through public policies, individual acts of discrimination and mob violence, and the long history of perpetuating the narrative of excessive black criminality as a justification for that segregation. And all of this to protect white spaces. Look at segregation in our schools. Think about the pathway to Brown versus Board of Education. Brown met with massive, violent, relentless resistance. Uh, just two years after the Brown decision, Arkansas Governor Orville Faubus got on television to announce that he was sending 250 National Guardsmen to defend Central High School against nine black teenagers who only wanted a better education. He promised that if any black student showed up to Central High, that there would be blood in the streets. And that has led us to today. And when you look at our public school system today, either you believe that there is something deeply and profoundly wrong and biased about our system of public education, or you believe in the worst and most violent stereotypes about the ability and intelligence of black children. Look at the history of public accommodations. Think about those freedom riders bombed and beaten and sometimes murdered. And why? Just so that black people wouldn't be able to sit next to white people on buses or to sit next to them in waiting rooms. And look at today, at the men and women calling the police on black people trying to live their lives in what they believe should be white spaces. Calling the police for barbecuing while black, napping while black, golfing while black, having a lemonade stand while black, or sitting in your own apartment while black. And all of this, to protect white spaces. In all of these areas, the country has made real and significant progress. Laws have passed and practices have changed, but in each of these areas, white spaces have proved remarkably resilient because those with power don't yield it easily. The boundaries this country has built to protect white spaces have a tremendous impact on those left out. It is not because black people get some magical benefit from living close to white people or sitting in a classroom with white people is because you cannot separate the places that people have access to from the opportunities that people have access to. My parents understood the need to challenge white spaces. They understood that access to opportunity meant entering spaces where we were not expected and were not welcome. And of course, we met with resistance. When I was a child, my parents moved from Windsor, Connecticut to Hartford, Connecticut, which is a Windsor is a from Hartford, Connecticut to Windsor, Connecticut, which is a working class suburb of Hartford. And they did that because they wanted to give us a chance to live in a safer neighborhood, to attend better schools and have more opportunities. And we moved into a neighborhood where we were uh, the first family on, black family on our block and only the second black family in the neighborhood. And of course, we were allowed by law to live there, but we were certainly not welcome. And our neighbors let us know that every chance that they got. And I still remember very vividly the day that we woke up to find that our house had been vandalized and KKK had been um, painted on our house and our car. I was really young, just nine or 10, and my parents had to explain to me who the KKK was and what that meant. And I was terrified to live in that house to play in our yard, to walk in those streets, to go to school, and I didn't do any of those things for a very long time. My mother wondered whether the Klan had come to our house and not the other black family's house because we played in the yard and their children did not. We invited our friends and family over for family celebrations and they did not. We played in the neighborhood park and they did not because we acted like we belonged, like that was our neighborhood, and they did not. Throughout my life, I have felt this push and pull. Following my parents' example, I've spent much of my life in traditionally white spaces, hoping to access the opportunities there. When I would start to feel like I belong, 
I would get smacked back. And that's something that continues, it seems like every day, I have an example of that happening to me. I teach civil rights at NYU Law School, and I often ask my students to read whiteness as property. It's an article that was published in the Harvard Law Review by Professor Cheryl Harris. And she argues that the set, quote, the set of assumptions, privileges, and benefits that accompany the status of being white have become a valuable asset that white people fight to protect. She explains how much white people rely on these benefits, so much so that their expectations inform the interpretations of our laws. American law, Harris writes, has recognized a property interest in whiteness. And we have seen this amplified on the national stage over the past several years, as more black people and other people of color not only enter these spaces, but act like we belong in these spaces. We see white people stand up to defend what they believe is their space and their privilege. And perhaps no single act in recent history triggered white supremacy's defense mechanisms as the election of a black man with an African sounding name. This resistance is only gonna grow as we approach the 2020 census and the confirmation that people of color are becoming a majority in this country. This resistance is gonna come in many forms. It's gonna come and be rhetorical and people of color will be told we are too stupid, too criminal, too unprofessional, and too loud to enter white spaces and they enjoy the privileges they have there. It will be legal, felt through the growth of exclusionary housing laws, Efforts like the one to put a citizenship question on the census, legal challenges to affirmative action, and the weaponization of police to inform white spaces against those guilty of living while black. And it will be psychological. More people of color will be convinced that they do not belong, pressured to behave in particular ways if we are to avoid discrimination and harassment. And scholars often call this performing whiteness. And it will be violent. We're gonna see more Trayvon Martins and Heather Hires Black people killed for entering white spaces and white people killed for standing up for their lives. So what can we do to fight back? I wanna leave you with three ideas. Ideas that I think help guide my work and my advocacy and that I talk to my students about uh, pretty regularly. Uh, first, we must reject this framework. We have to challenge those legitimizing myths. We can call out racialized categories designed to perpetuate privilege and we can reject the demand that we perform whiteness in order to be allowed in these spaces. We have to start to reject the idea and notion of white spaces. Second, we have to recognize how big and how complex the racial injustices we are facing are. And to solve big problems, we need to break them down. Otherwise, the problem feels insurmountable and it's hard to find the energy and, easily, and easy to be overcome by the challenge you face. An instructive example, I think, is the excessive force by police officers against people of color. Every week seems to bring a new video featuring graphic violence against black men and women. We are all frequently outraged by these incidents, but the sheer frequency of these videos and the lack of repercussions for perpetrators can be overwhelming. And we have to think about what can be done about a problem so big and so pervasive. To move towards justice, I think, we must be able to break apart these larger systemic problems and identify the forces that come together to bring us to that moment. And in the context of this police brutality, you have to break apart what contributes to that police brutality and, and its intentional discrimination, implicit bias, ineffective training, racial segregation, lack of economic opportunity, the over-policing of black communities, the failure to invest in non-criminal justice interventions that adequately respond to homelessness, mental illness, and drug addiction. None of these components are easily addressed, but breaking them apart is far more manageable than thinking that there is one lever that we can pull to solve police violence if only we can discover what lever that is. Third, we must keep the long-term goal in mind and remember that a long journey begins with a single step. The fight for justice is a marathon, not a sprint. And many of us experience frustration with advocacy because we want victory now. We want justice now. Some people have read the opinion in Brown versus Board of Education and think about the transformational change that that decision had um, on civil rights. But people also forget that Brown was the result of a decades-long advocacy campaign. 
and legal strategy. And indeed, the decision itself was no magic wand as the country continues to work to give full effect to that decision almost 70 years later. Small victories can be building blocks to systemic reform, and we have to see the benefit of short-term responsiveness as a component of long-term victory. And you cannot only fight for change you will see in your lifetime. We also have to fight for the change that we know will come in the future. These can be tiring times, but we should always remember that this is the way of history. It ebbs and it flows, two steps forward, one step back. An advance is always met with resistance. Reconstruction led to Jim Crow. The civil rights era led to the Reagan era. The election of Barack Obama led to the election of Donald Trump. And record political participation by black voters has led to a campaign of systemic disenfranchisement. And today is no different. But remember, after the dark darkness comes the dawn. And as strong as the defenders of white spaces may sometime appear, they are not as fierce as us, not as strong as us, or determined as us. Langston Hughes's poem ends, America, oh yes, I say it plain. America never was America to me, and yet I swear this oath, America will be. Thank you. Wow. Thank you, Professor Archer, for giving us so much to think about and inspiring us to continue the work. We will fight back. We will break down problems into solvable chunks. And we are on a long journey together. Audience, if you have questions regarding Professor Archer's talk, please head over to a moderated session with her in Stoddard Auditorium at 315, not Weinstein. It's a misprint in the program. Before we close with one more song performed by Black Capella, I have two pieces of news for you. First, I'd like to announce that in honor of Otelia and Adelaide Cromwell, President McCartney has approved a new research fellowship called the Cromwell Fellowship in Africana Studies. <laughs> To be administered by the Department of Africana Studies, this fellowship will fund three students per year to do advanced research, pursue internships, and or travel to do the work that was dear to the Cromwells, scholarship in the area of Africana Studies. Students may apply next September, and the first winners will be announced next November. Details will be posted on the Africana Studies website early next fall. Second, I'd like you to know that at the request of the family, Otelia Cromwell Day will, beginning next year, be renamed Cromwell Day. Uh, Cromwell Day will celebrate both Otelia and Adelaide as two of the many African American students who thrived at Smith College. Although they were from the same family, they represent diversity even between themselves. Otelia transferred to Smith in 1898 at the age of 24, a non-traditional aged student. Adelaide started at Smith in 1936 at the age of 16. Otelia studied English while Adelaide married, excuse me, uh, majored in sociology. They had different personalities, different setbacks, and different successes. Otelia was the first known African-American graduate of Smith College. Adelaide was the first African-American faculty member here. As Nikki Finney's poem so beautifully states, quote, we herald their bright hallmark of firsts, unquote. Going forward, we will celebrate both Otelia and Adelaide and continue the work of inclusion that they exemplified. And now, singing a song that they picked especially to honor Adelaide, Black Capella. People get ready. 
Just thank 